Well, good morning. Welcome to the Field Crops Virtual Breakfast. I'm Sarah Franzak. I'm an environmental management educator with Michigan State University Extension. Thank you for joining us this morning. We ask that questions in the chat box, um, you put your questions in the chat box found at the bottom of the screen and use that chat box tool to talk with our, uh, our specialist this morning, who is Dr. Asan Ghani. And this morning, he's going to be talking about combating excess water in the changing climate. Thanks for joining us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the virtual breakfast. So I'm going to be talking about uh, dealing with heavy rainfall uh, that, that, uh, that comes with the excess water on the farm in a changing climate. This is a, this is a satellite image of our planet Earth. We also call it the blue planet. The surface is 70% uh, water and blue, like this image you see here. It's a beautiful, um, beautiful photo. Um, with this, with the, with the, over time, as the temperature of the globe has gone up, um, the atmosphere has been temperature going up. It holds more moisture, and then you, you probably most likely you experience heavy rainfall. The heavy, intense rainfall, several inches in a short period of time, comes down and it causes problems on the farm. So that heavy rainfall is becoming more frequent. The climate scientists are predicting it's going to become more frequent. And it, we've seen the effect in, the, uh, in our current, current lives as well. So that brought, brings about the flooding. And I mean, recently we've seen the Kentucky uh, flooding and other parts of the world, we hear about flooding. Uh, there are certain ways we can deal with those things. I'm going to focus on the, the farm level for this. For the downstream level is basically storing water on the landscape is going to help with the flooding. The flooding is the most damaging economically out of all of the natural disasters. So let's take a look at some of the things we can do on the farm. What can we do there? Well, there's no silver bullet, but there are certain things that when you put them together, these suite of practices, things, uh, methods, they can help with this heavy rainfall. So the first thing is that you gotta make sure that your drainage system on the farm does not have an underperformance issue. And th there's a lot to that. There's yeah, it could be part of the drain could be you know clogged with sediment or with roots or with um, the main size could be undersized and there's you know soil could be compacted and with certain you know many different things. I'm I'm showing a screenshot in the bottom right. This is an extension bulletin that goes over these things that you you need to look for. So that's this is kind of a prerequisite to my talk. You want to make sure, because if, if you do all of the other things and the system has a problem, let's say it's got a design problem or the main is undersized or something, something's wrong with the underperformance, then doing the other ones is, not, is going to have a minimal effect. So you got to make sure you don't have an underperformance. So when you do that, the first thing you want to focus on is this improving soil health. This soil health is like it's shows in here, it's the heart. It's the main foundation of the whole drainage system. It, it's got to have a really good soil health. And here's a photo of a soil health, importance of the soil health. So what, with regenerative agriculture, where you store carbon and improve the soil health, these are the three things you, you can do in combination of each other, actually. Having these minimum or no disturbance of the soil, with no till and minimum tillage, having a cover or on the uh, on the surface with a cover crop, protecting the surface. This is important for improving soil health. And also in that underperformance, I I wrote that when you have the cover and you get this heavy rainfall, you're gonna protect the soil surface from the impact force of the raindrop. Um, so, because if that raindrop just drops on the bare ground, then it, it destroys that uh, structure on the surface, it creates crust, and then the infiltration goes down. So covering it is great. Uh, and then there's diverse, diverse crop rotation. So these three 
uh, are key. Why? Because they, they help, help build organic matter in the soil. They, they put the carbon, they store the carbon, sequester carbon in the soil. And with that, over time comes the better soil structure. Soil structure is key in water movement. Uh, it's going to help you increase infiltration, and also it's going to help water that's moving in, you know, on near the surface, uh, inside the soil. Because if with that, you're going to get water is going to reach the drain pipe quicker, and that's going to be key. So that's that's my first thing that I'm tip here that the soil health is key. That's going to have to be uh, a very very important part of the system. Because if the soil health, let's say you got a, the soil health is poor, you have poor structure, let's say the soil has poor structure, then that water infiltration is going to be slow, no matter you got the world's best drainage system, that's still going to be slow. So soil health, that's why it comes first, it's very important. So what about other things? So we talked about, we don't want to have underperformance, we want to improve soil health. Um, and then let's say you got a system already, there's certain examples of things that you could do. You have a system and you want to see what you can do. So for I show that first one, one, the first thing you could do if you have one, and that's typical, um, it happens is that let's say you got, um, let's say 30 feet spacing, drain tile spacing 30, for example, and then you just go in and split it in half, then you go into 15. That's going to help you take care and take the water away much quicker because you're going into a half of a drain spacing from a 30 to 15 as an example i'm giving you um, but you're going to have to put a lot of investment in that and you, that may be necessary for your setting so there are ways to find out uh, you know if that's going to be something useful and we have a drainage school uh, in march every year and we we teach we all go over those concepts how to come up with those ideas and how to determine is this overkill or is this something you're going to need so that's my first one the you know going with a narrower drain tile spacing um another one is that there's this mold drain uh, mold drain idea that you can actually either you can have just a farm with just mold drains or you can actually add it to a subsurface drainage system and also, you can also add surface drainage to the system. That surface drainage, I'll, I'll get to that. So let's get to the mold drain. This is the mold plow that is pulled by the tractor. And you can see it creates this um, narrow opening in the soil. Uh, when, when, the, when this plow is pulled, this bullet goes through the soil and it creates this um, channel. We call it a mold plow. So this is what it's going to look like when it goes in a diagram form. And you can see all of these cracks. These help water move down. Another application of this small plow is that if you have a compacted surface soil from, let's say, there were wet conditions and the field operation um, happened on that wet condition and then you got compaction. So this is one way you could break up, help with that compaction. For this, this is going to help, uh, you know, remove some of the water quicker because these are shallow. You can see the, the 16 to 24 inches here. You can see some of the cracks you can see on the, on the right side. There, there's, a, a, again, extension bulletin and also a web page on the website. Just search for MSU drainage. You'll go to the MSU drainage website. There's a full page about the details of what's suitable and um, you know, where you would do use these, these mold drains. There are common, these mold drains, I can tell you that they're common in Europe, New Zealand, and they're very successful. You're going to have to run them every four to five years, three to five years. But it's, it's much less cost, costly than having a drainage system. Another one is combining the surface drainage with subsurface. You can see um, this is to prevent the surface water ponding, but without causing erosion, that's key. That's why having a cover on the soil is going to be key, so the soil is protected. So the soil is not just bare, so that the excess water can flow over the naturally or artificially sloping ground towards those shallow ditches and grass waterways. You can see in this image, 
these ditches, shallow ditches, they, they have a green color to it because they, they have vegetation inside to, to keep their shallow, to keep from erosion. And you can see one, one of the key things here is that the land leveling is, is going to be part of it. This is, these are again common in um, other parts of the United States, like the Southeast, like in North Carolina, they get intense rainfall. And this helps it because there's so much that the soil can take in terms of the infiltration when the heavy rainfall comes, I mean, so, so, I mean that infiltration can take so much. So having, this is a, another thing that in my opinion, that's gonna be useful as we move in the years to come in the future, as these heavy rainfalls come. And this is one way, another way that you could work with that. And so we talked about on the performance influence soil health and you, you know, you have a drainage system, but if you're going with a new system, you can, you should consider the surface drainage and uh, you can consider the surface drainage and also the mole drains. But another thing you can consider is the shallow drains. Uh, this is something typical that in Michigan, if you're calling, if you're joining from Michigan, this is something that drainage contractors already do. The shallow drains are 28, 30 inches distance from the soil surface to the bottom of the pipe that's laid in the ground. This is typical. It has lots of great benefits. And then there's a pipe material that also is also important. This, this is a topic I talked about in June, the second one. So the shallow drains that come with the narrow drain spacing, they lower the water level more quickly. So if you have one of these, be sure that you, know, you, you have faster drainage than if you had put them deeper. And they help retain more moisture in the root zone. It's better for the crop, uh, reduces risk of crop, uh, crop drought stress during the dry years. It increases crop yield under certain conditions. We did research on that. This is from my own roof research. Uh, again, there's a web page details about these things, reduces year to year crop yield variability from year one to year two and so on. You get relatively steadier than if you have a deeper drainage system. So another, positive there, reduces the total water drain and have fewer days of flow. So during these times of the year, it typically, you know, trickles or just stops flowing and the total amount of water drains is less and that leads to less nitrate loss. It's better for water quality. <clears throat> and it's not limited to only like uh, flat surfaces, like say, let's say controlled drainage systems. It can work on any. So there's so, so much benefits with that. I'd like to um, move on to, so that's the shallow drains. We already have that. So I don't wanna spend too much time on that. So the drainage, uh, one of, another research that we did recently was we looked at the pipe material. This one I've talked about in June, during the virtual breakfast. And you can see um, that let's move on to the, to the summary of that same topic is that when you're looking for a pipe and you don't have, you have an undrained farm, you, you're thinking I'm gonna invest in the drainage system, definitely it's gonna pay back really well if you invest in drainage system. Uh, but when you're doing that, make sure you look for, if you wanna remove water quicker, then the eighth row is gonna be your answer to that rather than the fourth row for the same material cost. You can drain faster with the eight row pipe than four for the same material. Cost. That's 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 a bonus there. Um, so if you have a so there's two two conditions. If you have a drain sedimentation issue with the soil, again there's uh, information on the drainage website. More details. The saw crab pipe has fastest drainage. I showed in a previous slide quickly that about 29% faster drainage than a four row sand slot pipe. So that, that's very important. If you don't have one, the eight row is gonna be the fastest drainage. Again, if, you're, if you don't have it and you wanna install one. My last slide here, this is a summary. I wanna emphasize the water quality and crop productivity. This is, this is very important. Um, so I call these the, the foundations or the pillars of having water quality and crop productivity is the soil health. I talked briefly about it. Nutrient management, the four R, you put the right amount, right time. And this, this is very important. And also water management, that's very important. Water management, by that I mean that 
you have a system like a control drainage system where you manage amount of water that leaves the farm. So these three, these three need to work together. There's research that shows that let's say if you have, let's say one of these, let's say you have a no-till and you surface broadcast, then the nutrients are gonna leave. That's why it needs a water management and a system to, to help with, with that nutrient leaving the farm. That's precious, valuable, expensive nutrients these days. Um, so so these, these three need to work together for improve quality, water quality and boost yield. Again, it's key, these three working together, soil health, nutrient management, water management. So with that, I would stop sharing and finish the talk. Thank you for your attention. And we have just a few questions for Hassan in here. So one of the questions Hassan was, do the mold, um, the mold plow drains, do they work better um, with a certain kind of soil? Yeah, that, so that, that's a good question. Like I mentioned, the mold plows are common in, in Europe and other parts, in some other parts. And in terms of the soil, the, the more the clay, the better. Because when the, when the bullet is pulled with the, uh, with the mole plow inside the soil, and that cavity, that channel that's created, uh, if it's sandy, then it's just not going to work. It's just right. going to collapse back again. But it needs more and more clay. So the minimum, the best scenario is to have your minimum 45% clay content. Minimum 45% and uh, less than 20% sand. Uh, the less the sand, the better. That would be the ideal, that would be, uh, that, in that condition, the molding is gonna last for longer time, up to probably even five or longer number of years. But even the minimum, for the bare minimum, if you, if, if you wanna have a mold rain would be 35% clay. Um, that would be the minimum. But, more than 45 would be the, just the ideal, the best scenario. So look for 35% clay. And there are many uh, parts of the state with that 35% clay, especially the, the Michigan Thumb, South, Southeast, and some, mm -hmm. some locations are going to have that. There's some places. And the UP, it. especially. So one of the discussions we had about this earlier was that uh, in, in some parts, like the UP, for example, where there's hay and some other crops that have less cash value, less value that just really doesn't justify an expensive uh, subsurface tile drainage system because those could, per acre, you could be paying something like $3,000 to $5,000 per acre. So that, that's pretty expensive, right? So for a place like UP, a mold drain uh, would be really good. There's clay and there's, you know, uh, you know, it's suitable. It just doesn't, the crop doesn't justify that huge investment. So I would try, I mean, I'm, I'm available if anybody has more questions, my contact, uh, just search for MSU drainage, and then my contact would be on the drainage website. If anybody has more questions. Great. Um, we have one more question in the in the chat, it says, do you need a permit to run a field tile into a county road ditch? Um, I know the answer to this. I don't. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, well, I feel like that I need to parse out this question for a second because um, if the ditch is owned by the county road commission or is the ditch owned by the county drain commission? So is it a county ditch? And um, and who's actually maintaining that as one of the first questions you would have to ask, answer. Um, and then, um, so if it's a county drain, I believe you have to get a permit by the 1963 drainage law. So um, that would be something that you'd have to look into if it's a county drain. Um, and if it's a county road ditch and it's maintained by the county road commission, I would still ask permission because if they need a chance to armor the ditch from extra water coming in that won't erode the roadbed, I think that that's a fair, a fair thing to do. So what do you think about my answer, Hassan? Do you have anything to add? Yeah, there's a <laughs> answer. Another participant answered the you know, road commission, but basically I just call, give a call to the drain commissioner's office 
I mean, they, they probably will give you the best and right specific answer for your location. Mm-hmm. Right. And so each county is going to have a different process for that permit. Great. Um, I, in my experience, a lot of people think that what they're looking at is a county drain and it's probably not. Um, so it, it really varies from place to place how much is under the county's purview. Do you run the mole plow into a ditch or just put it into the hard pan and let it dissipate? Can I share a screen? To yeah. show the... I don't know whose screen is sharing right now. Jeff's, okay. Yes, yeah, so the answer is that uh, yeah, you run you run these into the ditch. So this is the bulletin that I mentioned on the website. So you run them in the ditch. Uh, so like I mentioned, you you could have a standalone system for just small. Just let's say you're in the UP as an example, and you don't have a tile drainage system, and you just want a mold drain, and you would so these small drains. Um, they look something like this. So the mold drains are going to have to just go straight drain in, you know, end up in the ditch. So the water can go, go, go into the ditch and actually drain out. So that's one, that, that, that's, that's a correct answer there that you mentioned that if it, does it have to go into the ditch? Yes. Another way is that let's say you have the pipe and you want to, increase that even more and this is something that is again in the literature and you can actually combine them if you look at the one on the left um uh, but but these have to go i mean so let me mention it you may be calling in so um, the mold drains have to be perpendicular to the direction of the plastic pipe perpendicular that's going to help the water movement the best so again, the mold drains go perpendicular to the plastic pipe tile drains. Um, that, and then they will, uh, then in that case, you could either, depending on the, it's going to be site specific again, depending on the site, you may be able to actually end up in a ditch. If you can't, the, the one I'm showing on the right side is basically you, you have every, every so many lateral drains you have a trench and then you backfill the trench with gravel and then when the tile the the mold plow runs through that it goes through this system that is highly permeable because it's got gravel in there so that what so this this trench acts like a drainage ditch just like similar to that because water comes in it goes in there and then it ends up in the drainage pipe and then it heads heads downstream to the outlet so there are combinations that you can do. So there's more information on that website, more, more specifics of information. But that was a good question. Thanks. We've got another um, question, but not about drainage. It's for Phil or if Kim is on. Um, yeah. night, there's some nightshade growing in a new hay seeding about one plant per 10 square feet based on their description. Any danger in feeding this hay? The field was manured this spring and planted with oats. Nurse crop oats was already baled off and the nightshade was growing up in the regrowth. Sarah, I know that Kim is not on today, so I'll take that question. Nightshade is highly toxic, as you already know, probably, Steve. So it's one of those things where it's, the amounts do matter. And what I... What I'm thinking is that since the amounts matter, the amount of hay that you actually are taking off of that field at this point uh, will have smaller amounts of the alfalfa because it's a new seeding. You're not going to have huge amounts. And so you would have a higher percentage of that nightshade in whatever is harvested, which could cause a problem. So based on the fact that we are uh, looking at getting maybe one cutting at this point, you may want to just chop that back onto the field and not feed it. Uh, you may have opportunities to uh, cut that annual plant off and it won't come back, but I would expect that uh, if the amounts are great enough, it could cause problems for any livestock that are eating that particular forage. I know that's not a great answer, but it's probably the best one that I've got. Uh, we can certainly run it by Kim 
later on, but I would be hesitant. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. All right. That's all the questions that we have in the chat. Can I yeah. take a minute? Uh, so for the audience that are here, um, we, I encourage you to sign off the field crops, our team, we have a field day. So again, remember MSU drainage, MSU space drainage, that's just search term. You take it, it'll take you to this website. We have a field day coming off and that field day is pretty much gonna be uh, covering what the last thing that I mentioned about linking the soil health, the nutrient management, water management, so that at the end of the day, we can get improved water quality and boost yield. So that's gonna be the theme of that field day. I encourage you to join us on that day. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna have live tile cloud demonstration. It's gonna be uh, with the uh, Michigan Leica partnering with the Land Improvement Contractors Association. It's gonna be great um, focusing on, like I mentioned, the soil health management, water management. Yeah, thanks for reminding everybody of that. That's a uh... It's going to be a good day, I think. We've got all the food and everything ready to go. So, um, well, we had a question: Is there any tar spot showing? So, Marty, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> you... um, so, yeah, there is. Um, there's probably about seven or so counties now where we've got reports of tar spot. Um, there's going to be a lag too between weather events and tar spot showing up. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, in terms of making fungicide decisions, um, it's difficult for sure. Um, so, it, I mean, it really depends on how the rest of the season plays out. Um, and, and I was kind of curious if Jeff can maybe comment about dew points, I guess, predicted dew points, given the cooler and drier, um, you know, conditions that we're, we're going to experience or predicted. And how that might play into things but um yeah it and, and then the timing of fungicides so there have been applications made um in late august where we do see protection from tar spot and you know protect yield protection but we've got to remember those are in situations where disease was building right so there were wet conditions um, so I would definitely be out scouting your fields um, it's out there it's inoculum is basically spread all over the state in the last couple of years. Um, so get out and scout and that would, you know, that's what I would use to help make those decisions. And as a follow-up to uh, to Marty's question, a very, very different uh, situation with dew point and humidity relative to what we had last week, again, which was extreme on the other end. Uh, dew points over the next upcoming week and maybe longer down into the even in the upper 40s and, and 50s there will be some dew uh, on a diurnal cycle you also uh, note that uh, less than normal rainfall so we won't have that source of water on foliage it'll there'll, there'll be some dew overnight but it'll be much much less the duration of that that water on the foliage than what we saw last week which is extraordinary great thank you marty i have a follow-up question on that tar spot in fungicide application, when is the latest that you would consider a spray? Yeah, that's a good question, Phil. So I guess if, yeah, so, you know, you're going to spray or you're not going to spray and then when, right? So let's assume we're going to make the application because we just want to, we've made that commitment that we're going to do that. I wouldn't go any later um, than August um, because, you know, especially if you're pushing into September there, now you've really you know, the time between um, protection and uh, black layer is, is you know, minimal, right? So you want to protect for as long as you can, but obviously you don't want to get, you know, you don't want to be spraying vegetative corn because that, that spray is absolutely useless now. So um, I personally, I wouldn't go any later, um, you know, than mid to late August. Um, those fungicides will provide protection for about three weeks, you know, thereabouts. Um, and so that's that's where I would be um, looking at things. Great. I think that's uh, the only question that we had in the chat. So is there and are there any other updates from any specialists on that they would like to share? Hearing none. <laughs> I think that um, 
we're kind of wrapping up here this morning. So thank you for attending. I guess that that's it. Um, thanks for attending.